one of the most important people on the guitar or in my life as a listener or a guitar enthusiast is Jim Hall. And this Lovers Project, in a way, has a lot to do with Jim. And there are certain pieces on the record that I always thought about Jim while we were doing them. And uh, especially Secret Love. Uh, I play Secret Love because I heard him play it. I'm not a Disney guy, so I, I, I didn't know the original version. I heard him play it with his trio in the 70s on a record called Live in Japan. And, and he, uh, so we play it in A flat major, the key he played it in. And I actually play, I reference a couple of his lines, improvised lines, whenever we play it. But it was my idea to have this heart, what I call a chord cluster heartbeat going through it in, in five, eight, over four. And, uh, and then I play kind of like Jim in my mind, just the melody, kind of with his tone and try to do some of his phrasing. And as we were tracking, I just thought, I can't wait to play this for Jim. And I met Jim through Brian Camilio just you know, a couple of years before Jim passed uh, and got invited to these lunches. And that's how I met Julian Lodge, was finally Julian came to one of these lunches with Scott Colley and, and uh, 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 John Pondell and, and whoever, Dave Binney, these people would be there, Chris Potter. And, and I was there as, as this kind of reluctant, you know, thinking I was like the, not the jazz guy and why was I there? But Jim was really interested in my music and I had written a piece for Jazz Times about Jim called 10 Tracks by Jim Hall, which I found out when I became friends with Julian, he wanted to do as well, but I got it first. So he ended up doing 10 different tracks or something. But Jim had read it and really liked the piece and wanted to contact me. So through Brian, I got invited to these lunches. He said, Jim would love to meet you. You gotta come to these crony lunches we have to get Jim out of the apartment because he lived a block from me. So in the West Village. And so anyway, Jim is obviously, I think everyone knows, he's one of the greatest musicians and, in my opinion, great composer and arranger. If you listen to his recorded output, especially in his later work, you hear incredible arranging ideas, not just great guitar playing. So a lot of this record had to do with inspiration I had gotten from Jim. I have no skill like Jim in terms of jazz guitar and harmonic information and innovation or I, I don't know a million jazz standards, but there is an aesthetic uh, connection in my mind to a lot of the music on Lovers to Jim and his work. And I was so giddy with excitement when we were recording this stuff, thinking like, oh, I can't wait to play this for Jim. But he passed away the last day of tracking. And, and there was something so kind of unexpected about that, even though it was kind of beautiful that he died in his sleep. Um, but I just, for a long time, I couldn't get over this feeling that I was so certain that he was going to hear it. You know, So in a way, the record kind of is, in spite of its stylistic diversity, in spite of the fact that there is a Sonic Youth song or my songs or songs that are just drones or whatever, uh, it's kind of almost all for Jim, this record. Uh, because, you know, I mean, I love George Benson, I love Wes, I love, you know, Bill Frizzell and all, you know, who's been a friend for years, all these great guitar players. But there's something about Jim, his modernist sensibility, his his uh, ability to be so understated, but be so absolutely potent in musical content. His uh, ability to play insane rhythm guitar, if you listen to the bridge or something, you hear him just comping. It's, it's one of those things that, that just, I can't get enough of it. It's so swinging, it's so great. And Jimmy Jufri 3, all these really forward-looking things, including Ornette Coleman, the science fiction sessions, where there's a blues suite, a long blues piece, and he's the guitar player. So no fear of playing with Ornette Coleman either. And, uh, or if you listen to a lot of his recordings, like These Rooms, uh, there's a lot of free playing. He was the most forward-looking and at the same time the most uh, 
beautifully traditional, not in a stodgy or curmudgeonly way, players ever. And so uh, having met him just a few times and hung out with him a little bit was a real blessing. And I just love the idea that he might someday, you know, I don't know how it works, if there's an afterlife, and, but if he could hear this music somehow uh, and get a chuckle out of Secret Love, uh, hear the, how I reharmonize the bridge and just scratch his head and go, really? Something, you know what I mean? Really, Nels? Okay, right, all right. Um, you know, that would make me really happy. Ready? Nels Klein. <laughs>